Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I, uh, I have a PowerPoint up, so I assume you can all see that. Let me know if you can't. So uh, yeah, the title of my talk is uh, A Meshy Exchange, Thinking and Performance in Conversation. Uh, and the basic idea here is that I'm taking a model that's used um, in performance studies where people talk about athletics uh, as well as performing arts. Uh, it's a model that tries to explain how thinking gets integrated into the performance. Uh, it's called the, the model of a, a meshed architecture. John Sutton and his colleagues have, have developed this. And I'm trying to use this model um, uh, in a way that it hasn't been used before. Uh, and specifically here in this context, I want to try to use it to talk about social cognition. And I'll take the, the example of conversation um, uh, as a place where uh, it has some application. So, make sure here. Okay. So here's an outline of what I'm proposing. Um, first of all, I'm thinking about social cognition, um, not in sort of the standard fashion of thinking about what's going on in a uh, in a mind reading process, um, but understood more as an embodied and situated intersubjective uh, interaction in the world with others. Um, and what I'm proposing is that we think of this as a kind of performance, uh, in which case we can go to uh, performance studies and find a model there that uh, integrates thinking and embodied motoric processes. And this is what I just mentioned, the meshed architecture. Uh, so the best place I think uh, the, this model is explained is uh, in Christensen, Sutton, and McElwain's 2016 paper. Uh, if you go and look at that model, uh, however, it's really focused on uh, exactly this integration of thinking and um, embodied motoric processes in the performance. Uh, and what I'm proposing um, is that we can enhance this model, make it more embodied and more situated, uh, so we get a, an enhanced mesh architecture, and this is what I want to take over uh, and use uh, in order to talk about social cognition and um, to look at conversation as a good example of a kind of social cognitive performance. So I want to start by talking about the model of a mesh architecture as you find it in, in uh, Christensen, Sutton, uh, and uh, uh, McElwain. Uh, and in that context, and in, in the discussion of this model uh, in performance studies, it's usually posed uh, in contrast to the work of Hubert Dreyfus. So if you're familiar with Dreyfus's work, Dreyfus would provide an analysis of expert performance, where he emphasizes the idea that the expert is in a kind of mindless flow. Where there's no thinking going on. There's no reflection. It's just a kind of pure action, a coping uh, uh, with the world. And so a number of authors have taken issue with Dreyfus's model, including Christians and Sutton, Richard Schusterman, Barbara Montero, Rafael Legrand, uh, and a, a number of others, uh, and have argued that in fact, uh, that performance can be much more mindful than Dreyfus uh, proposes. And um, in trying to work out how this, uh, how this uh, uh, happens, some theorists uh, conceive of a kind of top-down process uh, where, where they uh, also think about lower order processes uh, of the embodied coping uh, that get modulated by the higher order reflective cognitive aspects. So the idea is that you integrate the top-down thinking uh, or high cognitive uh, types of functions with bottom-up and usually conceived of as automatic processes that are uh, about motor control. So for example, uh, here Barbara Montero uh, in some of her studies of dance performance argues that optimal performance 
often coincides with reflective, thoughtful performance, where a thoughtful means, as she says, self-reflective thinking, planning, predicting, deliberation, attention to or monitoring of actions, conceptualizing, uh, where you're conceptualizing actions and thinking about control, effort, and having a sense of self and acting for a reason. So she pictures the, the thoughtful processes that go into the performance uh, in, uh, in, uh, in terms that seem uh, very high cognitive type processes. You find this also in, uh, in analyses of acting. So for example, Robert Cohen, um, who talks about theatrical performance, refers to the actor's preparatory thinking as she readies herself for the role, uh, and then in performance thinking, uh, which in an ideal situation is aligned, he says, with the performer's action. Also, you find similar things in Richard Schusterman, who talks about a number of different types of, of performance, uh, where we are conscious and we are self-conscious of what we're doing in those kinds of performances. And then uh, with John Sutton, uh, uh, who, who will give us this meshed architecture idea, uh, he describes the general idea in this way. So he says, skill is not a matter of bypassing explicit thought to let habitual actions run entirely on their own, but of building and accessing flexible links between knowing and doing. Flexible links, uh, yeah, between knowing and doing. Uh, the forms of thinking and remembering, which can in some circumstances reach in to animate the subtle kinesthetic mechanisms of skilled performance, must themselves be redescribed as active and dynamic. So uh, John also wants to uh, uh, integrate a kind of thinking, uh, a kind of thinking process uh, into the performance. If you, if you read through a lot of the literature on this, what you'll find is that there are variations on the, on, on the conceptions of what the thoughtful or heedful process really involves. So as we've seen, there were some descriptions of self-reflective thinking, planning, predicting, deliberation. Uh, Sudden talks sometimes about selective target control. Uh, others talk about a conscious monitoring. Uh, some talk about a sense of one's rightly configured body uh, or an enhanced pre-reflective awareness that depends on proprioception uh, and that is more performative or pragmatic uh, in the action uh, of the performance. So um, there are different ways to, to think about these uh, thoughtful processes, uh, regardless of how you think of them um, uh, or conceptualize them, uh, they somehow or other need to be integrated with motor control processes in the performance. And this is where the model of a meshed architecture uh, comes in. Uh, it's been proposed to explain how these mindful processes reach in uh, to the motoric processes during performance. Uh, so uh, Christensen, uh, Sutton, and Nuckelwain um, refer to it as a hybrid view according to which cognitive control reduces during skill learning as automatic control comes to play an increasing role. But cognitive control continues to make a substantial positive contribution at even advanced levels of skill. All right, so as, as we build our habits and become more proficient and expert, uh, it's, it's uh, true that motor uh, processes somehow or other uh, get more attuned and allow us to do what we need to do without necessarily thinking about what we need to do. Uh, but nonetheless, they want to say there is still cognitive control involved uh, from the top down. Uh, and they describe the mesh as involving quote, a, a broadly hierarchical division of control responsibilities with cognitive control usually focused on strategic aspects of performance and automatic processes from the bottom 
uh, more concerned with implementation. Uh, in all of this, they talk about, they describe a kind of situated awareness, uh, a consciousness of, of, of the performance while one is in the performance. So here they're, they're definitely disagreeing with someone like Dreyfus. So I think that there are different interpretations of the, the meshed architecture that are possible, depending on how precisely we understand the cognitive elements, whether we think of it as explicit thinking and remembering, or more like a heedful pre-reflective awareness. Um, but also uh, it depends on how we think about the motoric processes as well. Uh, whether we think of them as automatic or not so automatic. Uh, Christians and Sutton and McElwain, uh, I think, do think of the, the, the bottom-up processes as more automatic. Um, they say controlled and automatic processes are closely integrated in skilled action, and cognitive control um, directly influences motor execution in many cases. Now they give a lot, uh, by the way, I should say, they give a lot of uh, examples of this from, from athletics. And, and a number of other people are looking at uh, the performing arts to, to, um, to provide evidence for this type of uh, uh, process, this meshed process. So um, what I want to propose here is uh, a kind of an enhancement of this meshing process, uh, which I think is a, uh, will be a more complex conception of uh, what we're calling meshed architecture. And first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, three things that I want to introduce. The first one is a concept of intrinsic control. So I want to claim that control is not entirely top down, but rather, on this kind of vertical axis that they're describing, there are important bottom-up processes that should not be considered just automatic. So I wanna talk a little bit about that, um, those processes. Uh, but second, I also want to suggest that there's a kind of horizontal integration, not just this kind of vertical meshing of thought with motor control processes, but a horizontal kind of meshing um, that involves uh, environmental, social, and normative factors that really come in uh, to constrain the process. And finally, um, I think they, uh, there's very little said in the, the meshed architecture uh, literature about affect. So I think uh, affective processes also modulate the dynamics of the integration uh, and I think that happens on both the vertical and the horizontal axes. So I'll talk about you very briefly about these three um, uh, additions uh, um, in turn. The first uh, one has to do with how we conceive of the bottom-up uh, uh, motor control type processes, uh, whether we should conceive of them uh, as automatic. I think that's a central question. Uh, the question is, are motor control body schematic processes fully automatic? Uh, I want to say no. If we mean by automatic that they are consistently the same or repetitive or unchanging or unadapting, uh, then yeah, I think the answer is no. Um, here, uh, one could think of Jason Stanley, uh, Stanley and Williamson's uh, view or intellectualistic view of know-how and skill, where they think that really know-how uh, is a form of knowing that, a form of thinking, generally speaking, plus motor control, where the motor control is purely automatic, and uh, as Stanley puts it in his book, perfectly general, uh, which means that it's, uh, it's really the same in each instance, and it's only the, um, the top-down cognitive processes that will make adjustments uh, for specific situations. But I think there's lots of evidence that motor control is not 
automatic and perfectly general, but rather is highly specific and modulated by task and environment. And I've, I've made this argument in a, in a recent paper, um, and I won't go into all the details here, but if you have questions about this, I can come back to it at the end. Uh, I have a few slides that I uh, have in reserve if, you, if we need to talk about that. Um, so habitual, uh, we can think about this in terms of habit, and habitual movement or behavior uh, is not blind or repetitive or always the same. Adjustments are made relative to uh, task, environment, body position. There's all kinds of detailed um, aspects of performance here, um, including uh, the agent's intention and how that gets cashed out in uh, the intention in action. So uh, here I think we can draw uh, on conceptions of habit um, that uh, treat habit as intelligent, not automatic or repetitive, although it may be close to automatic in some respects. Um, uh, it's not uh, purely automatic. And there's a kind of intelligence built into the movement uh, control that is what I'm referring to as a kind of intrinsic intelligence or an intrinsic control. So here I could draw on Merleau-Ponty, uh, who thinks of habit uh, as, he says, the body acquiring the power of responding with a certain type of solution to a certain form of situation. And Merleau-Ponty's idea uh, here is very similar to that of John Dewey, um, who thinks that instead of blind automatic repetition, habit is an open and adaptive way in which the body learns to cope with familiar or unfamiliar situations. So Dewey says repetition is in no sense the, the essence of habit. Uh, the essence of habit is an acquired predisposition, predisposition, no, sorry, predisposition uh, to ways or modes of response. So uh, I think this notion of intelligent habit goes against the idea that these motor control processes are are strictly automatic. And then uh, I want to talk about the role of affect. I think affect shapes our ability to cope with the surrounding world. Uh, and it works differently in different types of skilled actions. Affective processes directly shape body schematic motor control processes. Slowing down or speeding up such processes, for example, or leading to the adoption of certain initial postures that may influence the performance and how the agent functionally is integrated with the world. So affect and body schematic processes are integrated, still part of, uh, we might consider it still part of the vertical mesh uh, in expert performance, but I wanna say that they also allow for an integration attuned to targets uh, in the environment and various environmental features, uh, which then takes us into this horizontal set of features in the performance situation. So on the horizontal axis, uh, this would include our relations with artifacts, instruments, established practices, and other people. Uh, so we could think of this in terms of the extended mind, uh, as Andy might want to think about it, or distributed cognition, material engagement theory, and there's a number of people working in this, uh, specifically in performance studies, Evelyn Tribble, some of you I'm sure know her work, uh, Joel Kruger, Andrea Schiavio, uh, and uh, Lambros Malaforas uh, are some of the people working ar around this topic. Uh, I think neither body schematic nor affective processes are isolated from the agent's environment. Rather, uh, we should say they are attuned uh, to both stabilities and variations in environmental factors, uh, including uh, other agents. So Simon Hofting has this really uh, nice uh, term, or <laughs> if, you, if you like terms like this, uh, he calls it interkinesthetic affectivity. So the idea that uh, our relations with others in the environment uh, 
during a performance, he's looking specifically at musical performance, um, uh, is characterized by a kind of affectivity that is shared uh, and that has, uh, is, uh, is very much an embodied sharing uh, with the other person. So, however we conceive of these things, uh, there are ecological, normative, cultural, intersubjective aspects of the physical and social environment, uh, including physical and social affordances that play a role and then I think have to be taken into consideration in this meshed architecture. So what I'm proposing here is a kind of an enriched uh, meshed architecture, enriched not simply along vertical and horizontal axes, but also we have to think about the dynamical relations among all of these different elements. And that means we can start to think of the mesh more as what I like to call a dynamical gestalt of processes in which vertical and horizontal are, uh, really turn out to be explanatory abstractions to, to try to to capture some of what's going on in this kind of dynamical arrangement. Okay, so now the idea is to take this enhanced meshed architecture uh, over into the realm of social cognition um, and use that as a model um, for the kind of social cognition that does not simply stay in the head, uh, that is to say, uh, a social cognition that is uh, understood more in terms of intersubjective interactions that involve direct inactive perception of intentions, affective states, the involvement of social affordances, and so on. And here uh, you probably recognize uh, Colwyn Trevarthen, one of your colleagues in Edinburgh, uh, uh, as a, a leading thinker in developmental psychology and his ideas of primary intersubjectivity, secondary intersubjectivity uh, are, I think, really essential for this, this interactionist conception of social cognition. Uh, and I'm sure some of you are at least familiar with some of these ideas. Uh, and I think also uh, communicative processes, which he also emphasizes, uh, play an important role here, uh, uh, especially uh, in uh, older children as, as they gain uh, language ability and so forth. So what I wanna do is simply focus on conversation as a good example of this kind of social cognition and ask whether we can uh, use the meshed architecture idea as a way to uh, provide a kind of analysis of conversation. So here um, I want to reference the work of uh, Charles Goodwin, the late Charles Goodwin, um, and uh, his, his notion of conversation analysis, which really is the rich analysis of speech acts that not only express or communicate thought, but in some way constitute thought, uh, because the process is situated in affectively constrained circumstances, that involve both embodied aspects, posture, movement, position, as well as ecological factors, the kind of environmental arrangements, the affordances, the other people in the environment and so forth. Um, so there's a nice example that he provides in uh, a paper in 2000 of this conversation analysis. Um, and what he, what he videotapes and then he analyzes a, a dispute between two young girls, Carla and Diana, uh, over a game of hopscotch. And what he shows is that there's this kind of interactive organization of various phenomena. He uses the phrase, uh, different kinds of semiotic resources that are there in the situation that have to be considered to understand this full encounter or to fully understand the encounter that, that's taking place between the, the two girls. So for example, he says, uh, spoken language builds signs within the stream of speech. Gestures use the body in a particular way, while posture and orientation use the body in another way. 
And all of these elements kind of enter into the conversational dynamics. Uh, he emphasizes, Goodwin emphasizes the visible public deployment of, of what he calls multiple semiotic fields that mutually elaborate each other. Uh, and they include, first of all, the temporal flow and the rhythm of high versus low and hard versus soft vocal intonation of the speech. That vocal intonation can have a deontic rather than a descriptive force. Uh, and it can clearly reflect various emotional affective states of the participants. The situation is that Carla, the little girl, is accusing Diana of cheating. So you can think of the kind of a, you know, emotional factors that could be involved in such a confrontation between uh, two kids. Also, body position is important. So one girl, Carla in this case, intentionally moves and stands in the way of the other girl, interrupting the game. So there's a kind of embodied intersubjective interaction. Trevarthen would say this is a primary intersubjectivity in the context of joint action, which is part of secondary intersubjectivity. The bodily orientations of the two girls, which allow for eye contact and joint attention uh, towards the hopscotch pattern on the ground. So there's a kind of focus on one part of the environment, but these things change across the conversation. So there's a lot of dynamical uh, moving about uh, in terms of what's happening in, in the environment. There's ongoing reference to a completed action, which was Diana throwing a marker on one of the squares. Uh, there's a set of instituted norms that have to be considered in order to understand what, what's being said and, and so forth. Uh, these are the rules of the game of hopscotch, for example, as well as ideas about cheating and not cheating. And uh, there are other people in the environment too, other kids who were playing the game. There are also hand gestures happening. Uh, they're dynamically integrated with the speech, um, but also are positioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the body positions of the two girls. Uh, so as Goodwin describes it, Carla has to use her body in, quite precise, in a quite precise way while taking into account the visible body of her co-participant. Co She's faced with the task of using not only her talk, but also her body to structure the local environment such that her gestures can themselves count as forms of social action. He continues, unlike talk, he says gestures can't be heard. And this means Carla actively works to position her hand gestures so that they will be perceived by Diana. Carla's hand is explicitly positioned in Diana's line of sight, thrusting the gesturing hand towards Diana's face. And that twists Carla's body into a configuration in which her hand and arm and upper part of her torso are actually leaning towards, leaning into Diana. How close uh, the gesture is to the other girl's face, um, that has a meaning. The proximity would have a meaning. Uh, and if it were not a gesture, but rather a touch, how hard or soft or where the touch occurred would also have a meaning. The gesture is meant to be attention grabbing, forcing the other to orient to the point being made in the speech or to the point of a joint attention uh, on something in the environment. And a grab could serve the same purpose. Also, importantly, for the idea of interaction, this is not one-sided. The other girl uh, is standing on one foot, attempting to finish her jump through the hopscotch squares, and attempting, in fact, to ignore the other girl, and, of course, ignore the accusation of, of cheating. So there's a kind of disruption here also going on in the interaction. So the interaction, the conversation, is not confined to vocalization and gesture. Reference is being made to the physical environment, 
with glances to the hopscotch squares under discussion. So we can think of this in terms of a kind of distributed cognition, a kind of material engagement. And the joint action uh, that is needed for, for the encounter to, to keep going uh, gets disrupted or broken when one girl looks away. Uh, so again, the accomplishment of meaning involves two-way interaction, uh, is not just under the control of one individual. And then in another moment, Carla stomps her foot, another gesture uh, that hits three semiotic points at once, where Diana happens to be looking and looking at the hopscotch square, which is in question and exactly on what is being talked about, the object of the speech. So uh, in all of this, Goodwin shows us that there is a complex integration of primary and secondary intersubjective uh, capacities situated within a pragmatic and social context that is both supplemented with and uh, supporting communicative processes. So we want to keep all of these rich details, but we also want to try to map them onto the model of a meshed architecture in order to gain a fuller and perhaps more organized picture of their dynamic integration in social interaction. So I think one thing we can learn very clearly from Goodwin's analysis, uh, this is uh, not about different kinds of performance uh, uh, in, in the arts or in athletics. So sometimes this doesn't happen in those contexts, but here, in conversation, of course, speech is involved. And that speech has to find its way into the mesh in some way. Uh, and I, I think, you know, specifically, we can picture it as, as belonging to that vertical integration of cognition or thought and motor control. Uh, as Austin once put it, by saying something, we do something. And as Merleau-Ponty has said, speech accomplishes thought. We don't do our thinking purely in our heads, but in fact, as we communicate, as we say what we mean, this is where the thinking gets accomplished uh, on his view. So thought is accomplished in the speech acts, but also uh, in the gestures and the meaningful postures and movements. Um, and it, it gets constituted as it is communicated. There may be some strategic thoughts about what to say or how to put the accusation, it's about cheating, but these uh, thoughts take shape within the particular circumstances of the communicative uh, situation. Uh, they're motivated and modulated, I think, by each girl's affective state. You can think of uh, the anger uh, or maybe the feeling of injustice that may characterize both sides of this conversation, uh, which, which serves to sharpen some of the facial expressions and gestures uh, in a way that generates meaning. Right? Again, these, these kinds of gestures, facial expressions, for example, smirks uh, or a grimace or a look of exasperation uh, uh, and, uh, and just the proximity, the way of being in your face. Um, uh, all of these things, as I, as I said, have, have meaning. So affect really is, is I think, permeating uh, this, uh, uh, this process. So Goodwin in his analysis is already, I think, exploring parts of the horizontal, what I've called the horizontal axis the material and normative factors, the various semiotic resources that populate the environment, and the dynamic interactions that bring these things together and this situate uh, performance. So they include uh, what we've seen already, the artifacts, for example, the marker that is thrown down, the hopscotch squares, the rules of the game, the other people. There's a kind of affective atmosphere as well. Um, you, can, you could imagine perhaps the amusement or the discontent of the other players as they're looking on you know, at this confrontation. Uh, but this is uh, you know, what Hofting called the interkinesthetic affectivity, 
that might be felt when, um, for example, when other people would take sides uh, uh, for one girl as opposed to the other, and so forth. So uh, that's, pre that's pretty much what I wanted to do. Uh, my my, you know, it's uh, the conclusion here, uh, if, if we can uh, even uh, say it's a conclusion. Uh, it's, it's more or less a, a, a rehearsal of what I've just said. Uh, if in contrast to uh, standard theories of social cognition that reflect intellectualist conceptions of mind reading and methodological individualism, for example, uh, which tries to reduce uh, mechanisms of social cognition to just what's happening in one individual or in one brain uh, in order to explain it. Um, if in contrast, we pursue the idea that social cognition is a kind of performance, which, which takes us, I think, some distance away from mind reading per se, um, or from some kind of uh, reduction to a set of neural activations in the mirror system or something like that. Um, if we pursue that kind of idea, then I think we need an explanation then of how embodiment and affect and social and communicative practices and the ecological and normative factors, how all these things come into play um, and, and how they shape social cognition. Uh, and if that's the case, then I think we need a model that allows us to capture and to organize some of the details. And so that's the proposal that the, the meshed architecture model that has been developed somewhat in the performance literature can be kind of borrowed and, and, uh, and used in the concept uh, in, in our analysis of social cognition to try to, to give us an organized picture of how some of the, the various factors dynamically relate uh, to uh, one another. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. If you, if you know Gaelic, there you go. And uh, I, I assume you're all there, but I, I don't hear